Good morning. I want us to talk about this morning about the power of love. Not romantic love, so those. And I just want to say this um, even as we start, and we will probably make mention of it later on, that love is very powerful. Um, it can break even the lover, the one who loves, especially when that love is rejected. People do all kinds of things when their love is not accepted, such that it is um, very risky to love because there's a possibility that your love may be rejected. That's how powerful love is. And uh, I will share with you this morning the best way of protecting yourself from being broken by love. Okay? Um, we are going to read Matthew 22, verse 35 to 38. Now, our theme is that Christianity makes sense. In most cases, it makes more sense. Um, yes, there are other systems, and they uh, have contributed to our lives here on earth. It would be incorrect of us to say that this world is what it is because of Christianity. We know that science has made contribution medication in the field of science, and many other disciplines as well. Politics have messed the world, but they've also created order in many ways. Um, so those systems do work and are functional to a great extent, but it is our belief and my um, conviction that Christianity, uh, compared to all these other systems, uh, most, makes more sense. It doesn't answer all the questions but the questions it answers, uh, the, the ones that it answers, makes more sense. So Ma Matthew 22, 35, it says, <clears throat> Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the commandment, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus says to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is amazing. And sometimes we, we, don't, we take this for granted uh, that when, the, when this text, when this lawyer asks the question about which of the law is the great commandment, which is the great commandment. He is asking God. He is asking the lawgiver. So Christ does not need to reference what he says. He is asking the one who gave the law. He says, tell us. And one of the things that we really uh, need to really wrestle with and, and appreciate is, is the fact that the, the God who created us walked on this planet to explain and help us to see that Christianity makes sense. He came himself. The Bible says he sent prophets in the past, he sent messengers, but in the last days God has spoken through his son. He says, you know what, let's just go there and explain this thing to them. Personally, no sending anyone now. We're going there on our own. Now you're going to go there and be born and be incarnated and become a baby and you grow up and you will explain and help them understand what this Christianity is all about. What it means to believe in God and the importance of loving God. And so the answer then comes from the, it must be credible and authentic, it comes from the owner of the law. He says, love God with all your heart, or your soul, and your mind. In other words, in the loving of God, all these faculties are developed. This is amazing. If I'm going to love God with all my mind, which is my mind must be developed in order to be able to do that. So loving God is not just an emotional 
thing. Ah, I just love him. It must also be reasonable and reasoned love with your mind. Love with all your strength. Love with all your soul, all the capacities. Remember when God created man, he was created in his image. So in all these aspects, man, when he fell, his soul, his mind, his body was affected. It was not only spiritual that man was affected. Even his thinking capacity was affected. Remember, we said early in the week that uh, all those creatures, man, humankind, man created in the image of God, has, has been given power akin to that of the creator. Power to think. And that power, which was given to man at creation, remains with him. It has been tarnished but it has not been re removed. And so the salvation therefore seeks to bring all these aspects, to restore all these aspects, not just spiritually only, but also the mind, the thinking capacity. Sin has affected our thinking. Elsewhere, Ellen Dwight says, we young men and young women must be taught to be thinkers and not the reflectors of other men's thoughts. Don't be a plagiarist. Don't just go about copying and pasting other people's ideas. Quote other people, but you must also be quoted. For you to be quoted, you must think. So thinking is part of worship. When Christ hung on the cross, it was not only for your spiritual, um, but it was also for your thinking. And your body is important to Christ. In Christianity, body is important. This is not evil. Body is important. You take care of your body. Of course, this body is going to be changed, but it will be changed after you have learned to take care of it. So that when you are given another body, you'll know how to take care of that body. Remind me a story of a young man who was sent to a school and uh, he was struggling with mathematics and later on, managed to get good marks in maths and the parents were surprised and wanted to know what has happened. Why are you all of a sudden getting such marks in mathematics? He said, it dawned on me one day when I was at chapel and I saw a man hanging on a plus sign and then I realized that if I don't do my maths, I'm going to end up on that plus sign. And so the cross for that young man meant that do your mathematics. If you don't, you're going to hang on the cross. Now what I'm saying, beloved, is let us not in Christianity look down upon thinking and reasoning because people have used it to come up with other conclusions that are against God and then end up saying, let's throw the baby with the bathwater. We were created to think. That's why we read in Peter, that always be ready to give reasons for the hope that is in you. Defend. Now people say, no, I don't need to get um, education. Jesus is coming soon. So what? Let him find you a solution. Study. Not a waste of time to develop your mind. That's part of salvation. So the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I say, this concept of love is powerful. And it is the source of growth and development. So without love, without love, we cannot develop. One of the reasons why we must train and be trained, it is because we must go love our neighbor. You've, you've got to find creative ways of serving your neighbor. And for you to do that, you must go and be trained and be educated and develop and advance so that you can be able to serve. So this whole idea of serving and service is the greatest motivation for development and reading and learning and studying. Powerful incentive to study because you have to serve. And now you think about the fact that your life is basically for you to love God and serve fellow men. So whatever you do, you, you regulate it by those two things. It makes all the endeavors you do to expose yourself to how to do things very important indeed. It's part of our religion. 
to love our neighbor, to serve our neighbor. It's not just something that is just ethical. It is part of worship. It is in the same commandment. So you can't say, no, I'll just do the first one and, and neglect the second one. No, it says the first one and the second one. The first one and the second one. If you do the second one, you can't do the first one. If you do the first one and do the second one, you have not done the first one. It's both of them. In other words, this thing of loving our neighbor is not an option. I know we relegate it and I'm just going to keep the Sabbath. Yes, if you're going to keep the Sabbath and not love your neighbor, you have not kept the Sabbath because Sabbath is there to remind you of your responsibility to your neighbor. And if you don't get it, your Sabbath is in vain. There are only two commandments, Christ says. And this sums up the whole law. The first table of the law deals with our relationship with God. And the second table, our relationship with men. And if you're going to focus on the first table, then you've broken all of God's law. Oh, by the way, this is not a New Testament construction. This is not something that comes only from New Testament um, that Christ spin it around and constructed it and say, okay, let me tell you something that I had in mind. No, this is actually what the Bible teaches. By the way, <clears throat> if you read Luke 10, 25, uh, which is a similar text, but in a, from a different angle, the lawyer, Christ, the lawyer asks, How, what can I do to be saved? And Christ says to this um, lawyer who's supposed to be an expert in the law of Moses, he says, he says, and Christ says, how do you read? So this time around, he was not going to give an answer. He says, how do you read? And then he says, well, as far as I've read, um, the Bible says, or the law of Moses, which is the foundation of the whole Bible, the law of Moses expects us to love God with all our hearts and our soul and our strength and to love our neighbor. And Christ says, you've answered very well. Go and do that and you will live. So you see, this, it was known. So this was not just a response from Christ. This was known, it was known by those who, have, who were experts also in the law of Moses. In other words, <clears throat> remember there was no New Testament at the time of the New Testament. So they were not quoting from Matthew. <laughs> Matthew had not written anything at that time. So they were not quoting from Matthew, no, they were quoting from Luke. So wh where was he quoting from? This lawyer. From the Old Testament. So what he was saying was quoting from the Old Testament. So this thing of love your neighbor, love God, is an Old, Old Testament ethic. It is an Old Testament injunction. In Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. It's in Deuteronomy. One of the books contained in the law of Moses. Leviticus 19 verse 18, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that has always been part of the Bible, the centerpiece of the Bible. Love God, love your fellow, love, love your neighbor. Yesterday we mentioned the fact that uh, we always, uh, when, when we, the essence of Christianity is the fact that uh, we move from darkness to light and then we walk. That's basically what we are doing in preaching, in reading the Bible, in understanding who God is. Salvation can be summed up in this one thing, that is, you were once darkness, now you are light, walk in the light. Ephesians 5, 8. That's it. So when you are preaching, um, those of us who are being trained to be preachers, you are doing two things. You are, you are, you are actually um, speaking and, and, and compelling people to accept Christ so that they cease to be darkness. Either you are doing that or you are talking to those who have accepted Christ to walk worthy of their call. That's all you do. That's all preaching does, those two things. What are you doing? You are either calling sinners to accept Christ and encouraging those who have accepted Christ to walk in the light. But what do, we, what do we do when we walk in the light? Two things. We love God, love our neighbor. That's all. It's not big, it's not a lot. Just love God, love your neighbor. And your wife to those who are married is your neighbor. Your husband is your neighbor. There are people who love God, but they hate their wives and they hate their, their husbands. How do you do that? That's your neighbor. Actually, marriage, I know very few of us are married here, so. But let's say this. Sometimes in marriage, 
your neighbor, like your neighbor next door, you may actually greet your neighbor and, and smile at your neighbor and struggle to smile with the one you're staying with at home. And so sometimes we say, when the spouses are fighting, we say, just love her as you love your neighbor. Just treat your wife as your neighbor. Okay? Just, just follow the Bible. Treat her. Forget about the fact that it's your wife. Just treat her as your neighbor and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Don't beat your neighbor. And so, it looks simple, but then it's very profound, and it is, it is what keeps us busy in this world. It's just that sometimes we tend to major on those things that we think we can do. You know, it is the easiest thing in Christianity. Let me say this. Uh, like the easiest thing in Christianity, the easiest thing in Christianity is to love God than to love neighbor because nobody knows whether you love God or not. You see, it's between you and God. So, so the, the, the best way to hide is, I love God, I love God, and make noise. Oh, that's fine. But how do we know you love God? By going to church on Sabbath, we're going to be looking at that. How do we know you love God? And so people talk about loving God and being spiritual, a spiritual warrior, fasting for 40 days and doing all kinds of things. Why are you doing that? If you're not doing that in order to love your neighbor, it's in vain. Do you know why we fast for 40 days in fullness? So that we can be strong for our neighbor. You think God is impressed with you starving yourself? But I'm going to ask a question here that sometimes we, we don't reflect on. Now, let's, let's come back now. Let's, let's come back and, and let's reason together. As Isaiah would say, let's reason together. If God says to you, if, if, if the Bible says you must love God with all your heart, isn't this a command? Yes, it is a command. But can you command, can love be commanded? Can, can I say to my wife, you must love me? And then your, 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 my wife loves me and says, and, and they ask, the friends ask, why are you loving him? He has commanded me to love him. I must obey. Yes, Baba, I obey. I'm going to love you. You must love me. I'm going to love you. And God, now think of, of God saying, you must love me. Why? Because it's a command. We have to love him. We have to love him. Why? Because he has commanded us. Now, once you start thinking like that, you have moved away from the context. And I'm going to explain that. Because this is how people do it. They love God and it's so painful. But they have to love God. What can, what can we do if we don't love him? We know where we're going to end. Hell is waiting for those who don't love God. So you don't love me, I'm going to find you and I'm going to look for you. And when I find you, I'm going to destroy you for not loving me. Okay, I love you. You know, do you know why people are atheists? It is because they don't want to love their God who is so cruel that he will kill them for not loving him. So they run away from that God. They have a problem with a God who demands love. But love comes from the heart. You can't be commanded. And so they run away from that God. They said, God is cruel. God is, 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 is vindictive. I will have nothing to do with him. And some of us say, you know what? Me, I'm going there because it makes more sense. If I don't, I'm going to go to hell. And as a result, we make hell everywhere we go because we are worshiping a God who is cruel and we in the process become cruel because you can never be better than the God you worship. Do you know what we do in Fundis? If we are in power and we are not loved, we punish those who don't love us. Yeah, that's what politics do in the church and elsewhere. If you don't love the leaders, they'll set you straight because that's what God does to those who don't love him. If I'm the president of the conference and the pastors don't love me, they don't, they don't love me, they don't to say nice things about me, I'll deal with them. You know why? Because that's what God does to me. I'm learning from God. Let's explain that, because if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to have the Christians we have today who are worshiping a wrong God. Now, here's a point that I'm going to make, and that is our love for God is a response
All right. Say with me, our love for God is a response. Can you say that? We are responding. We are responding. In 1 John 4, it says, we love him because he first loved us. We love God. Not because he commanded us. We love him because he first showed us that he loves us. Because he has loved us. That's why we love him. Our love is a response to what he himself has done for us. We love God because he first loved us. If you ask a Christian, why? That's First John 4, 19. Why do you love God? The answer is because he first loved me. That is a proper definition of love. Coming from us, it is a response to what God has done for us. In other words, we're bouncing back the love that God has shown to us. So God beams his love to us and we bounce those lights of love back to him. When we love God, we are returning. We are returning. We are returning his love back to him. And sometimes that's where the problem is. It is, not, it is not proportional. We always retain a little bit. But we grow in retaining that love. The more we uh, accept this love, the more we are show, showing it, the more we accept it, the more we are showing it. It's that be beautiful, gracious cycle. In, in Romans, Romans 5 verse 8, Paul says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And when Christ died for us, he was demonstrating his love for us. There are no sinners who are loving God. Sinners were hating God, rebelling, running away from God. When God came in the Garden of Eden, Adam was on his way out. He had bought training shoes. He was running away from God. So God, through his love, demonstrates his love. In that he, God, reaches out to those who hate him and dies on the cross, crucified by those he had come to save. And so Paul says in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated that love, that while we were yet sinners. So you think God loves you because you are a preacher? He should love me even more today because I preached for one hour. Yo, by the way, I fasted last week. The whole weekend, God loves me even more because I starved myself almost to death. So God loves me. But here he says, while you were a drunkard, a rapist, a violent person, God loved you. You are what you are today because God has transformed you with his love. And so when God says, love me, he says, love me because I've shown you. Love me because I've capacitated you. Love me because I've made you to be able. In other words, when, when God says, says, love me, he says, do yourself a favor and learn to live. And you live by loving me. What, what a beautiful commandment. It's like being commanded, command, commanded to, eat your, to your, you eat your breakfast. Eat. I command you to eat. You can't say, I'm doing him a favor. I'm doing him a favor. No, who's, who's, who's doing, who's, who's benefiting it? Why are you eating? God says, I must eat. Okay, so... Are you angry? Yeah. If he didn't say so, I would not eat. I'm doing him a favor. Stop eating and see what's going to happen. You're going to die. Not God. You will die. So when God says, love me, he's like saying, eat. Because if you don't, you're going to die. You can only be sustained. If I have loved you as a sinner and you are what you are today, you'll be sustained by that love. So when you love me, you're doing yourself a favor. I'm going to make that point very strongly before uh, just a few minutes from now. Uh, just be patient with me. So why does God love us? Is it because he sent his son to die for us? That would be a good reason. I love you. I have to love you, Papa. Why, 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 God do, why do you love me? Well, I sent my son. I can't just send my son and not love you. That's a good thing. I sent my son, so I have to love you. No, the text says, John 3, 16, for God so loved that he sent 
he did not send so that he can love. So, so the very cross that we talk about is the product of God's love. So, so the cross stands there to say, hey, hey, people, check. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. By the way, if you study all these other religions and their gods, very few of those gods love. The Greek gods didn't even know what love is. You see, the moment you love as a God, the, a, a loving God, a God who loves and even makes noise that he loves, is limiting himself. When you say you love a person, you are saying, I will never do anything to harm you. You have limited yourself. When you say you love a person, you are saying, I'm giving you a choice to reject me if you want. You have also already limited yourself. When you say, I love you, so you can reject me if you want. You are limiting yourself. Gods are not supposed to love people. Because when they do so, they are confining, they are limiting their power. So God loves us, not because he sent his own son, but he sent his own son because he loves us. No, someone can say, you know what, Pastor, I've, I've got an answer. You know why God loves us? He loves us because he created us. And that's a good one also. Why do you love me? I created you, my son. And when I saw you and said, look, it's so beautiful, it's so good, I said, I've got to love this. I mean, sometimes as parents, uh, our children will come when we don't expect them, you know? I mean, I'm talking about children, like children. They, they come when you don't expect them. We were just walk, taking a walk, and the child pops, comes up. And uh, so what else can you do? You just have to love that child. He's here. Not that you said that and planned, we need a third born honey. No, we were fine. We were okay. We were surprised. But then we say, who? Let's love. It's God's gift. That's beautiful. So you think that's what God did? He was taking a walk and then poops came Adam. No, God loved Adam into existence. Not because he was existing. <laughs> you see, his love produced Adam. But Adam did not produce God's love. His love was the source of his existence. But his existence did not uh, uh, produce love in God's heart. So God loved us when we were not there and we became because he loves us. So we are the product of God's love. Look at yourself. You are the product of God's love. God says, I love you. Why? Because, because I love you. You see, God loves us. And the reason he loves us is because God is love. So, so the reason why God loves you has to do with God, not with you. Don't look at yourself to find out why God loves you. Look at God. Don't say, hey, I wonder why he loves me. I wonder why. He... No, 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 no. You can do that with your boyfriend. I think he loves my hairstyle. <laughs> and then keep working on your hairstyle. Because, you know, if that hairstyle gets messed up, he's gone. But no, 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 beloved. God does not love it because of your hairstyle. Your hairstyle is lovely because God loves you. His love has made you who you are. You are beautiful because of his love. He doesn't love you because you're beautiful. So we are the product of God's love. And this love, beloved, that loved us into existence, listen to this, it will also love us into extinction. You see, in, in the book of Revelation, those who are burning in the fire, brimstone, fire, and, 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 and sulfur, those who are burning in the fire, the, the, the Revelation 14 says, they are actually tormented in the fire before the presence of the lamb. Not before the presence of the lion. You see, Jesus is presented as a lamb, and when you think of the lamb, you think of the cross. So those who are in hell are actually dying in the presence of the cross. Why? Because even in their extinction, God loves them. So the last thing they will have before they die eternally is the cross that they were loved to the point of extinction. So you think 
You think people die, people go to hell and burn because God's love has stopped. Hell is the extension of God's love. If God was cruel, he would take you to heaven and punish you there with holiness. It is because God so loves that he respects your choice and allows you to go. How would you enjoy heaven if you can't love your neighbor? Because there will be all of them, there are many of them for eternity. How are you going to enjoy heaven? God says, you know what, let's spare this guy. He hates his neighbors. Let's just allow him to die. Because he hates his neighbors. He hates his neighbor. Don't punish the poor guy. Because then he's going to go to heaven. Sorry, can I have just my own private heaven? where it's me alone, because I hate all these people. It's miserable to stay with people you hate. Do you know that? You can't even eat. It kills you. You die. So God says, you know what? Let's allow him to die, man. Just forget. Let him die. And then we move on, because if we take him to heaven like this, the guy will be looking for cigarettes in heaven. He will prefer death, because for eternity he will be looking and he will not find And so, we say, therefore, that even with man's extinction, we still see God's love. I'm moving very slow. I have to move fast. So, what is the nature of this love? This love is stronger than our rejection. God can accept your rejection. He doesn't punish you for rejecting him. He punishes you for the consequences of rejecting him. And those consequences of rejecting him is you killing your neighbor. If you were to stop loving God and be fine, God would have no problem. But the moment you stop loving God, you start killing his neighbor, your neighbor, then God will deal with you. What makes God angry is not what you do to him, is what you do to your neighbor by refusing to love him. By refusing to love God, you are capacitating yourself to be a monster. And God deals with monsters. He can't be a loving God and allow monsters to live forever. That one who rapes that 13-year-old, that man who rapes that 13-year-old, he does so because he has refused to love God. And so God punishes him, not for not loving him, but for raping that. And he did it because he did not love God. So it's the other way around. God does not punish you. Oh, let me put it this way. God does not need you. So when you don't want him, it's no big deal to him. He is God with or without you. It's not like your boyfriend. When you stop loving him, he chases you with a, with a knife. God does not do that. His love is so strong that he can accept your rejection. He does not die when you stop loving him. You die. He does not need to kill you because without him, you can't live. God does not need to kill you as if you can survive without him. His love is unconditional. God's hobby is to love. He just enjoys loving. God is love. But the question is, why is he commanding us to love? Are we not going to be punished or judged for not loving him? But here's the point, beloved, that we miss at times when we read this text and run quickly. You know, with ancestors... If you don't love them, they'll punish you because not loving them affects them. If you don't remember them, they are in trouble, so they'll punish you for not loving them, for not doing things for them. You see, there's a symbiotic relationship between us and our ancestors. We love them, they take care of us. We do things for them, they do things for us. We, we help each other. You don't think, don't think God is your ancestor. I'm going to worship him, so he's going to bless me. I'm going to go to church, so he's going to give, give, give me money. I'm going to give him tithe, so he's going to give me a job. Hi, that's not God. That's your ancestor. God gives alone. And whenever you give back to him, he says, give to your neighbor, not to me. So God commands us to love him so that we can be able to love our neighbor. So the love of God capacitates us. It gives us the power, the strength to love because love is dangerous. In order for God to protect us from being destroyed by our love, he says, love me. And when you love me, 
you'll be protected as you love others. We are afraid to love others, but when you love God, you are able to love others. So when God says, love me, he's trying to say, this is how you can love your neighbor, because you must love your neighbor. So for you to be able to do that, love me. Once you love me, because I love you, so once you love me, you accept my love, because loving God is to accept his love. Once you accept the love, you become strong, then you are able to love. And that's what we need, even for your romantic love, you must have God's love in your heart, be strong, because you can love a person, and the person becomes unfaithful, and then you lose your mind, because he has taken your heart. Pastor, how many kids have I spoken to? How many uh, couples have I spoken to? Mfundis, the man, this woman has broken my heart. What was your heart doing in that woman or in that man? When God says love, he says, let me have your heart. So you can go love with the heart that is in me. It can never be broken. Your love can be rejected, but you will not be broken. The relationship can be broken, but you will not be broken because your heart is in my hand. So when God says, love me, he says, love me so I can protect you from your boyfriend who's here today, gone tomorrow. I love my wife. Don't tell her that. I love my wife, but uh, I don't need her. That's why I can come here for a week and live here in Nairobi. He's not, she's not my oxygen. You are my everything. Without you, I'm nothing. No. <laughs> Beloved, here's the point, and it is worth mentioning. There's no way you can love God without loving your neighbor. It's impossible. When you say you love God, think with me. When you say you love God, I mentioned this earlier on. When you say you love God, what do you think you are doing? I love God, so what? What are you going to do? What are you, going to do? you love God, so what are you going to do? I'm going to go to church, yes. I'm going to sing songs, yes. So God is going to be happy, yes. So you think God needs your hoarse voice? To, you, you are you're entertaining God with your hoarse voice, terrible, sinful voice. When you come to church and you sing, you're doing it for yourself. It is for your own benefit. It doesn't benefit God. Oh, I love God. I'm going to return tithe. Return tithe. Return tithe. Have you ever seen deacons pushing this tithe to heaven? The only way you show your love to God and God says, love your neighbor. Beloved, this is it. And we have forgotten about that. We think to love God is to do crusades and do efforts and, and do evangelism and do all kinds of promotion and run up and down this union and preaching. No. To love God is to love your neighbor. In all your preaching, my pastor, if there's no love for your neighbor, you're not worshiping God. Why are you preaching? Ah, to please God. To please God, I'm preaching because I love these souls and I would like to see them saved. And God has sent me to do that. You're not just doing it for God so that one day he can save you. So love of God is a litmus test. I'm going to say this, and I know I'm running out of time. Um, I'm going to say this, beloved. Love God so that you can love your neighbor. Worship God so that you can be, you can be put together and be consolidated so that you can be able to love, even though your love may be rejected. Love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? <laughs> he asked in Luke 10, Who's my neighbor? Anyone in need is your neighbor. So Christianity responds to the needs of people. You are not a pastor so that people can meet your needs. You know, sometimes we become pastors and ministers and teachers just for the people to meet our need. No, you don't serve in the church to meet your need. You meet their need. Your neighbor is the one in need. That is why when they left that poor man, they're dying, rushing to church. Christ says, I'm not impressed. Service is not rushing to church. It is meeting those in need. Christ didn't spend all his time in church in the morning, Sabbath school morning, divine service, afternoon, evening, in church. 
Christ will just come for an hour or two and be out there and meeting the needs of people, healing those who are sick. I think we spend too much time in church. That's why we end up gossiping and doing all kinds of things. We're looking at each other for too long. Worship was supposed to be here. We worship God to get strength to go and save, to go and save, to go and be out there. Even afternoon service, morning service. And people are wondering, what are they doing there in that church? Spending the whole day. Let me tell you something, and I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it nicely, and I'm not going to argue this. When we fail to love God, do you know that in Matthew 25, when Christ comes, he says, sheep and goats. Do you know what makes, what's the distinction between sheep and goats? Is those who love their neighbor and those who don't. The goats are those who don't love, the sheep are those who love. Period. There are two groups, those who love and those who don't. And how does God in the end determine who's going, to, who's going to go to hell, who's going to go to heaven? Those who clothe the poor and feed the hungry. He says, I was hungry and you did not feed me. But, but, but pastor, uh, but, but God, I was, I, was, I, was, I was fasting. You know why you fast? So that you can take your food to those who are hungry. You're not fasting so that you can have a figure. You fast so that the food you are going to eat, you take to the hungry. The issue is I'm fasting so I can have my eyes open and see the need. He says, I was hungry. And so he says, because you did not clothe me, you are then going to be lost because you did not clothe. Do you know why you're going to go to hell? Because you did not love your neighbor. I know some of you are very intelligent and you are saying, but pastor, when I read the book of Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, I'm doing fourth year now, when I read the book of Revelation, I see there the mark of the beast and it centers around the issue and the concept of worship. And people worship the beast. That's why they go to hell. That's why they, they are lost. And according to Revelation 14, those who receive the mark of the beast will be tormented. And I say to you, you who don't love your neighbor, you will receive the mark of the beast. Because you, the mark of the beast is associated with Sabbath. And the true litmus test for sab true Sabbath keeping is loving your neighbor. Go to Isaiah 58 when you have time. And Isaiah says, feed the hungry. Clothe those who are naked. And then that whole chapter, at the end, it talks about the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath. And the true Sabbath keeping is actually seen in how you treat your neighbor. And those who worship the beast will hate their neighbor because the beast hates you. So the mark of the beast, those of you who are excited about the mark of the beast, the COVID and the vaccine, mark of the beast, forget about that. The mark of the beast is how you treat your neighbor. We know which God you are worshiping by how you relate to your neighbor. John says, how can you say you, you love God you've never seen and you hate the person you've, you've seen? That's what brings God's wrath is how we treat our neighbor. God does not need our worship. He deserves it. It is for our own benefit. We need to open our hearts so we can receive God's love as we worship him. And this will make it possible for us to love the unlovable. Christianity is about love and we have failed dismally. Colonialism with Christians involved, oppression, uh, slavery, all kinds of evil things. And Christians were in the forefront. No, we're not supposed to be there. We're supposed to love. Debele. Eman Debele. Tandana Mashona. That's your neighbor. No, I just love God. You know, what about the Shona? Love, I'm a Shona. I'm a Shona, love, I'm a Debele. I'm talking to you guys here in Zimbabwe. We are Christians, man. We are Adventists. Love each other. Ah, but in front of you, I want to turn to my son. Hey, how about my coach again, love? So, what is the great command? Commandment in the law: love God and love your neighbor.
How many of you are saying, Lord, please help me to love you so I can love my neighbor? Let me see your hands. Our kind and loving Father, please forgive us, Lord, for having failed to love you. Because in the way we have treated our neighbor, our brother, our sister, it is an indication, it is indicative of how we treat you. It is showing how much we regard you. So we ask you to forgive us. We have sinned by not loving you in hating our brother. Help us to love you so we can love our brother. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.